Welcome to chapter 11 of the Anderson textbook, but uh, essentially the topic is inference for variance. Uh, and inference, as we know uh, from our previous experiences, just means estimating a confidence interval or, or testing a hypothesis. We're delving into a new population parameter before we talked about the mean, the population mean, uh, where could it be, could it be this value, could it be that value, yes, no, that kind of stuff. Now we're going to talk about the population variance and by extension the uh, population standard deviation. Okay. So one nice uh, example I like, it uh, resonates with me, um, why this topic uh, can be pretty important. So the U.S. Uh, Government Accountability Office, the GAO, it's, um, they sort of, they're, uh, they're a government monitoring body. It's they're within the government of the United States that ensures that thing, money was spent appropriately and sort of verifies things. So for instance, um, if they hand out grants, they make sure that the grants were handed out appropriately. Uh, when government spends money on a program, they evaluate its effectiveness and do all that kind of good stuff. Okay, Treasury Board in, in the Canadian federal government operates very similarly. So anyway, so the GAO, they found this plant uh, where uh, they're, they're measuring the effluent. Effluent is... Um, Stuff they uh, a plant or you know basically pollution that goes in the water emissions is pollution that goes in the air so effluent so they're dumping po you know pollution in, into the water and uh, they're just you know you have to take measurements to make sure it doesn't there's not exceedances it doesn't go above certain thresholds and so on so they're they're looking at these variants of these measurements from this one plant and my gosh it, the variance is much less than uh, other plants and so right away you start to think okay this could be a good thing could be a good thing maybe because um, the key thing with a, a lot of emissions and effluents uh, and and pollution in general it, it's sometimes it's not so much the level it's the extremes right so hey here's a here's a process you know there are no big extremes up no big uh, you know no big down that's kind of a negative but you know no big spikes up you know they're all within a tight band maybe it's a you know an efficient plant maybe there's some best practices that could be spread out to the other plants uh, this, maybe this is good stuff okay? so anyway so they, they, they looked at this um, a little bit closer and what did they determine oh crap numbers are made up <laughs> sometimes too good to be true is too good to be true but you know instead of being the positive that hey is there a best practice to emulate it's say hey these people are cheating and it's important that you know to get that all figured out as well right so Test for, for variance, you know, can be very important. Other things that we can use this for, um, when we're filling containers, right? Just like we had with the, the cereal example in uh, a previous unit, right? We don't want to overfill it, we don't want to underfill it. But the customers, if they're buying it, and they're buying it in precise quantities, they want to know how much it is that they're getting. Right? And they want to be getting that on a regular basis. Right? That when you order 400 grams of cereal, you're always getting, we're pretty close to almost always getting 400 grams of cereal. Right? One of the ways to determine that is to measure that, that variance. Right? To do an inference for variance is a good way to do that. Okay, so again, lots of examples where it's not, hey, it's not that, hey, yeah, it's great to get more than you expected, uh, it's all, but it sucks to get less than you expected. But sometimes when you're trying to plan your production process, you don't want to be rolling the dice. Right? You don't want to be carrying a whole lot of extra inventory because your supplier is highly variable in how much uh, it uh, supplies to you. Okay. So planning... Risk reduction requires consistency. Inference for variance is a good way to measure that consistency. Okay, so with a new population parameter that we're testing, we've got a new distribution. Right? When we were talking about uh, the means, right? we had a T distribution, we had a Z distribution. Right? 
Whether we knew the population standard deviation was what drove whether we used the Z or the T. Well, here, when we're talking about population variance, we have a, what's called a chi-squared distribution. Okay? And based on that chi-squared distribution, we'll then come up with some confidence intervals and then do the hypothesis testing based on that chi-squared distribution. So some unique processes related to that chi-squared chi distribution that we'll get into in just a minute. So an assumption that we, we make is that the population from which we are drawing our measurements and then doing the inference of, of uh, variance is a normal population. And there's some theoretical reasons for that. And, and uh, when, you, when you take that normal population and you square it, because remember, if you, if you visualize here, you remember when we were doing, or when you did, uh, calculations for variance and standard deviation in your first stats class, right? You had, you were squaring the differences, right? You had an observation, you subtracted from that observation the mean, and you squared it, and then divided by the degrees of freedom. Uh, and and so with that squaring, we're essentially taking a normal distribution, we're squaring it, and you know it kind of transforms into a chi-squared distribution. So very very convenient that way. Uh, the sample variance, which we call S squared. Right? So when we had sample standard deviation before, which we called S. Now we have sample variance called S squared. Uh, and it's considered an unbiased estimator for the population variance. Okay. So we, our test statistic, so we have a calculation for our chi-square test statistic, and it's just N minus 1, which is the degrees of freedom, times by the uh, sample variance, and then divide by the population variance. And that gives us our, our test statistic. Right? we'll use in, in step three of our hypothesis testing uh, for variance. Uh, the chi-square distribution has n minus 1 as its degrees of freedom. So like the t, it has a degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, when we start to get into confidence intervals, uh, it's a, it becomes a little bit tricky. When we were doing confidence intervals for a Z distribution, for a T distribution, those were bell-shaped, they were symmetric, they kind of, they're centered around zero, made it real easy to work with, and you know, everything was all lovely, right? Uh, we found one, we found, we got, could, could just go plus or minus a given T, or plus or minus a given Z, everything was kind of neat. The tricky thing with the chi-squared distribution is it is not symmetric. <laughs> It is not centered around zero because we're squaring stuff, so all positive numbers here. And, and uh, because of that squaring of a normal distribution, we're sort of got a right skew to uh, the chi-square distribution. Okay, so with that right skew, it means when we're finding that those margin of errors and the test statistics in those margin of errors, um, you're going to have to look up two different values in our tables or using Excel. Not a big deal. Uh, the notation goes so chi squared with alpha with the degrees of freedom. Uh, it just represents the area to the right, uh, and then we have um, we'll have another value in, in the area to the left. So here it is, a nice little picture form: uh, chi squared alpha over two uh, with the degrees of freedom n minus one gives us sort of the, uh, the chi squared statistic. Uh, on the right, and then one minus alpha over two, again, same degrees of freedom, gives us the chi-squared test statistic or chi-squared statistic for confidence intervals on the left. Okay? You can kind of see this chi-squared distribution is not symmetric, uh, and that's why we need to have two different values, uh, because uh, although the areas in the right and the left-hand sides are both alpha over two, the cutoff points are different. And since we're not centered around zero, it's not going to be just a uh, a positive and a negative number, and it is easy as that. Okay, so there's, there was there's a little bit of math behind behind the scenes on this that is not really super important to us, uh, but in, in essence, uh, it, it involves uh, a manipulation of uh, uh, starting off with the normal distribution, squaring it, and moving stuff around, and and on and on. And, and we derive this result for a confidence interval, lower bound on the left, upper bound on the right. Uh, and so we see that the numerators are the same, but the denominators are different, right? So the denominators are dependent on those two respective test statistics, or uh, chi-squared statistics. Okay. Now, these are two chi-squared 
statistics and uh, they come off the same table. It can be easy to get them mixed up. But we've got to think this thing through a little intuitively, right? The left hand side is the smaller number, the right hand side is the bigger number. Okay, so, so far I'm stating the obvious, Mr. Captain Obvious here. Uh, however, so we Note that for the right-hand number to be the bigger one, it has to have the smaller denominator. Uh, and if the left-hand side is to be the smaller number, it has to have the bigger denominator. You know, for instance, uh, 2 over 4 is a bigger number than 2 over 6. Right? 4 being a smaller denominator than 6. So 2 over 4, bigger than 2 over 6. So it's kind of, it, it's like that. So if you happen to get the two chi-squared values mixed up, just realize the bigger number is the upper bound, the smaller number is the lower bound, right? Kind of, don't, don't throw common sense out the window uh, just because we have a formula here. Uh, we interpret this the same way. You know, if we have a proposed uh, population variance, or alternatively, if we square root each one of these bounds, we have a common interval for the standard deviation, we can still have proposed values and see, do they fall in the interval, do they not fall in the interval, and, and draw inferences in the same way as we did when we were doing confidence intervals for the mean. Okay, so we have a new population parameter, we have a new test statistic, a little bit of a different formula for finding the confidence intervals. That's all calculation stuff, but the interpretation aspect of it still stays the same. Okay, so let's look at those uh, when you have tables. I note that the tables typically provide, and this is always important boilerplate when we're looking at the Z distribution, a table provides chi-squared values area to the right. So that becomes somewhat important to us. It provides us values to the right. Okay. Now, so let's look at an, an example here. So just isolating. If we have, uh, we're finding 95% um, confidence interval, okay? Alpha over two, right? If 95% confidence interval means alpha is 5%, alpha over two, two and a half percent. Same as before, nothing has changed. This is all standard, standard boilerplate stuff. We're just inserting a new context. So for one of the chi-square test statistics, it'll be one minus that value, so point chi-squared for 0.975, and on the other side, it'll just be 0 0.05 divided by two, and we'll find the chi-squared value related to 0 0.025. Okay, so not a problem. We look at our tables, and we still have our degrees of freedom, and, and in this arbitrary, just toy example, we have degrees of freedom of five, so we start off with the row with five in it, Right, just like we did with the T statistics and the T distribution. We look at 0.975, we get the 0.831. We look at the 0 0.025, we get the 12.832. And we know that the smaller number, the 0.831, is going to be associated with the upper bound. And the bigger denominator, the 12.832, is going to be associated with the, the lower limit or the lower bound. Okay. So nothing uh, too terribly scary in that particular regard. Okay. So when we visualize this, we, we see that uh, 0.975, right, right? We think bigger number, bigger numbers are on the right-hand side of the number line, smaller numbers are on the left, and so we see that uh, 0 0.831 is on the left, the 12.832 would be on the right. In, with, in regards to the distribution. When we start to plug it into the formula, it sort of all flips around, right? Okay. Now, before we get into a, a regular example, let's just kind of roll with this as we see it on Excel, okay? So I'm just gonna pull in the Excel sheet here. So we have uh, some useful Excel functions that'll help us out here quite a bit. So when we did with the t distribution, we had t inv. Well, we have chi squared inv too. So we have chi squared, right, our distribution, and then dot inv, just like we do for the t. Now, what's really cool is we have two choices here. We have chi squared inv and chi squared inv dot rt. Now, Excel tells us here, we see chi squared inv says, hey, returns the inverse of the left tail probability for the chi squared distribution. 
Oh, that's cool, right? I need one of those. I'm trying to find the confidence interval. I need a left-hand tail. Now, RT, hey, let's just swing for the fences here. What do you figure RT just means right tail, eh? So, we can find the uh, left tail. We can find the right tail. Do, do, do. We got our, our two chi-squared uh, test statistics, our t uh, statistics really, really quickly and easily. So probability, now this one's the tricky one, is because it's just looking at one tail or another, we have to do the alpha over two by ourselves. So I know when we had the T inv, right, we had a T inv dot two T, which did the two tailed uh, calculation for us, and divided by two, we did a lot of things behind the scenes. We don't have that luxury here, okay, because we're finding each tail individually. We need to note the uh, area under the curve in that respective tail, not the combination of the two tails, okay. So in that case, 0 0.025 here, the degrees of freedom was 5, close the bracket, and we're done. 0.831212, we got 0.831 from the tables, that's superb, right. And then we could also find the other chi-squared uh, statistic, chi-squared, dot inv again, dot rt this time, and then the probability is 0 0.025, and then degrees of freedom of 5, or whatever it happens to be, and we get the 12.8325, right? So we get those numbers, easy peasy, just, just like we did before, uh, just very quickly uh, on Excel. So Excel can really be a, a huge time saver for us uh, in the future. Okay. Next clip, we'll do the examples.